everyone. Welcome to this conversation about Queen of Hearts, Audrey Flack. It's one of our favorite documentaries in the festival this year. Um, my name is Catherine, and we have with us our fearless leader, Joanne Graziano, who's the festival director, um, Sean, who's also who does the tech for our festival, and also our co-presenter, Kat Kariski. Did I say your name correctly? It's, it's close enough. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. That's generous. Um, uh, who works with Real Abilities, and you are the director of the festival, Kaka, correct? Yes. Awesome. Um, Kaka is with us because of the like very important theme of um, Audrey Flack raising her child um, who had uh, autism back in the 50s when that was very difficult to do. So um, who wants to start? What did you guys think? I think it's remarkable that Flack, I mean, first of all, one of the things I love, the film is really well made. It, it, it shows how she falls in and out of the kind of the, in favor of in the, in the art world. And do, do you agree with that, Catherine, as somebody who's actually, who actually works in art? Yeah, I think they caught up to her. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah. Um, I have a lot more to say about that, but I want to hear <laughs> your thoughts. Okay. I'm, I'm, well, I'm anxious to hear the lot more you have to say about that. I am because I'm, you know, I'm new to Audrey Flack. I, I did see her work out at the Parish Art Museum back in, in that show that, that is, is actually on, in the film. And it was shocking to me when I actually watched the film because I know this, I know this show. I actually, you know, I went to the museum and saw it. Um, she was actually new to me too. I went to art school and I totally learned about the photorealist movement and I never, maybe I've forgotten because it was like 15 years ago, but I don't recall ever, ever hearing about Audrey Flack. Um, so I'm really happy that this documentary was made because I think she was obviously very important and added sort of a feminine aesthetic to the movement that I think it needed. Um, but What's interesting to me is that when, when Audrey Flack started, the world was still very much steeped in modernism, you know, as it was for most of the 20th century, which was like a very masculine philosophical and art movement that was all about sort of mastering nature and um, sort of rejecting the old, the old world, right? And that included rejecting traditional painting that used to, you know, back in the Renaissance, strive to be realistic. And so actually photorealism in general was, was really sort of scoffed at. And then of course, within that movement, she was ridiculed for being too kitschy and too feminine, like as we saw in the, in the, in the movie. But uh, what's interesting to me is you know, I think in the 70s is when the world was sort of tra traditioning, transitioning to postmodernism, which is all about referencing other genres, which is exactly what photorealists were doing. So I think that she actually now, if you look back, she looks like a pioneer, um, whereas before people maybe thought of her or just didn't know what to do with her. I mean, there's kind of a lot to be said of artists that are sort of ahead of their time. And I feel like she definitely was ahead of her time in many ways. Like, I, they, it kind of like shocked me the sort of dismissal of her sort of her whole style, like the whole the whole Vanitas sort of like period of it, like sort of the, this collage kind of building um, that she does with her with her painting it's just like it's it's kind of, it's so masterful and it's there's so much in it too like talk about mise-en-scene it's like really kind of like so much kind of like being told to you but you ha it's not immediately obvious which is kind of nice too so you have to kind of actually take it in um which is the best thing about art is <laughs> sort of like that sort of uh sort of um kind of communing with it, I guess. Yeah. Well, and speaking of, of Vanitas too, just like, so Vanitas was a style of painting, mostly in the Netherlands in the 17th century. And it was these still lifes that usually had a skull and some rotting fruit. And they sort of, um, they all had the same theme, which was, it was about the transience of life, the certainty of death, and the futility of pleasure. 
which um, I, I remember learning about this in school and being like, you know, if it's all about how life is gonna end, that seems like it's making a pretty good case for pleasure to me. And I think now after watching this film, Audrey Flack is clearly pro-pleasure. Like she likes to have yeah. a good time. <laughs> and so I think a lot of her paintings back in the 70s were like these pro-pleasure vanitas, which is so cool to me. And there's a nice moment where she's kind of talking about um, the Wheel of Fortune one, and it's got the sort of the reflection of the skull, but then there's also the mirror that's like upturned. And I mean, her use of like, of perspective angles, oh my God, like, yeah. like so brilliant. Um, but then the reflection of the mirror of the mirror with the rainbow, because it's actually like showing us above, you know, that kind of glimmer of hope. And I was like, this is really kind of amazing, like how much is locked in to this. And you'd, ha you'd have to really look at like her paintings for a long time to kind of really take them all in. So yeah. clever, so totally. clever. But then like to be an art critic and overlook those symbols is just egregious to me. Like that's your whole job. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually funny. Well, it's kind well, of I, I think they were dismissing that. I think that they were dismissing it as kitsch, right? And not kitsch, in, not in, in considering that kitsch then, be, you know, they were kind of doing the, you know, the Greenberg, you know, kitsch, bad, you know. Right, they just missed the point entirely, so they didn't think to look for symbols because they didn't think there would be any there. No, it's it's women's baubles, and the way she got the luminosity on kind of the pearls and the objects, the objects that she puts in the space are are fascinating. But then she makes the choice to stop painting as an artist. She stops. And do you have any information about that at all, Catherine, about why she makes the decision? Or do you have any thoughts about why she might have made the decision? Was it just defeatism? Did she already feel like she had gotten to the place where she needed to be with that particular job? Yeah, that's what she said, right? It's just, she's like, I've done, I've done what I wanted to do with photorealism, um, which was absolutely put her own mark on it. Um, but I don't know. I kind of think it was maybe something sort of complicated and private and personal because she, she does allude to the fact that she got really depressed because she just couldn't paint anymore. So I don't know. I'm, I'm curious to know that too. It's kind of like so the height of her getting like beaten down by the critics and the press and, and everybody who is like looking regarding her work. And that's, that's a lot, you know, all that sort of negative feedback is so, so a lot. And especially if you're, you know, she also, I mean, she had the extra burden of motherhood and children and stuff like that on which a lot of her male counterparts didn't necessarily have like you know she talked about in the documentary about you know having to paint and then like go home and cook dinner <laughs> you know and kind of take care of her family and that's that's you know that's a burden that's not necessarily um forced on a, on her male counterparts and you know that i'm sure that that burden is is it's a lot it's a lot yeah that's one of those things too, that especially right now, it's really apparent how much that's still a problem. <laughs> like so many of the women I know who are mothers are like, oh, okay, now I'll work from home and also do all the childcare, I guess, even though my husband calls himself a feminist. <laughs> like, it's just like the, the gender roles haven't caught up to like our, our ideology about them, I think, in a lot of cases, but. Do you feel like there's a, like a lot, element of mockery in the in the way she approaches vanitas and her art to like that that there's a sense of humor and in, in in the way in her sort of take on vanitas that she like she sort of makes fun of of like the gravity that yeah and know, like the austerity of it i think so. back you know looked at it yeah that's when when i see her paintings that's you know that's that's the sense i get uh, a little bit yeah um but I don't know if the critics got it. <laughs> no, I don't think they did. And maybe like, because we're looking back on it through a lens of a more postmodern world, I think it's it's e maybe easier for us to understand, but it was just so new that maybe mm. it makes sense. And another thing I, it makes, I, I like, I spent a lot of time thinking about the concept of like a feminine aesthetic and whether that's even a real thing. Um, I think that it is, but I, mean, I would be curious to know what you guys think. Um, but going back to, to modernism, I think that um, 
it actually ushered in this kind of polarization between masculine and feminine aesthetics. Because if you think about what art was like before modernism and even fashion, like before modernism, the art was, we had impressionism. Everyone was painting freaking flowers. Like all of the like top male artists were painting like beautiful fields of flowers. If you look at fashion, it was everyone of every gender was wearing like lace and jewels and stuff. Skirts. Yeah. And architecture was more ornate. Like there just didn't used to be such a big difference between this sort of austere, like dark colored masculine aesthetic that we have now and the feminine aesthetic. And in fact, you could even say that what we now call a feminine aesthetic used to just be called like beauty. <laughs> um, and so I think art for like almost a century was steeped in this like, um, really like everything must be like strong and powerful. And for when Andre came along, people were like, nope, like don't know what to do with this. So I thought that was cool. Um, couldn't you say the same thing about, um, you know, um, the bachelor grinds his coffee a lot and that people didn't know what to do with that either? Wait, what do you mean? Yeah, um, I, there are some male artists that come earlier that that actually are male artists who kind of play with the whole idea of kind of, but they're more the trans kind of, you know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to ask you about how you felt about the way the, the film or or she made the choice to confront Albers through confronting the painting. Oh, yeah moment when she goes and she's not only the artist who's kind of gone completely against the person who was set up to be her mentor so when she walks into the it, it, the the, um, the director's decision to have her kind of confront her mentor in that way and say you know my art was so different this is what I was taught I was brought to Yale it was an honor but I was I wasn't going to not go my own way and then the fact that in that moment is when she reveals what it was like to be alone in the studio with him and have him kind of cross a line. Mm. And, and she does it in, as an old woman in front of her, his art that she hates. Yeah. Fabulous decision. And I, I would love to ask her or Deborah if, if that, whose choice that was to do that there, you know, to have that come forward. Because it, as, as she said, I mean, this is not something people haven't heard me say before. And of course, this is not what her whole art has been about, but, what did you think of that choice, Catherine, to have her kind of do that there? I haven't thought about it in this way. I want to hear what other people think, honestly, because I think I, I never, uh, I just actually haven't thought until right now about how powerful that was. Um, I mean, I, I, it was powerful to me that, sh that she was sharing this moment that, you know, most of us have had. And, and it's, it's always important to, to, to share that and where and how you do it is significant. But, um, yeah, I hadn't thought about it in quite that way. But I also think it's it's not the most important moment in the film. So it's it's there, it's important, but it's not the thing that the film's about at all. It's really about her kind of evolution as an artist. And that's what's phenomenal. I, I think the other thing I want to ask you too is, um, you know, she works in different medium and then in the film and in her personal work, she returns to painting in the end of the day. Is that because she found herself as a painter again? Is, do you think that has something to do with the issue that arose with um, the, the, the commission to make that piece in Queens mm. that can, the statue, yes. became yeah. um, you know, a cause celeb that wasn't good? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe she just had enough time and distance from it that she was able to approach it fresh because her new work is so different from her old work. And I think sometimes you just you just need that time. But um, yeah, like like you said, I love how they didn't. Um, they showed us the moment um, of Audrey being being sexually assaulted by Albers without um, making it seem like that was the reason for her rejection of his aesthetic or like that like made her who she is or any of this other shit that we always see in movies where it's like a turning point for someone that like makes them into a badass <laughs> like no, she it was like knew what her aesthetic was it wasn't his right. she was right. stuck in this place in Yale where everybody was doing this there's the circle there's the circle there's the circle um 
Yeah. And that idea of the um, of the role, the she, and she still comes through that period that you know that Agnes Bard is coming through. And I, Agnes Bard is older than her, obviously, but um, but she's coming through that period when there's an expectation of women. The fact that her mother, when she got into Yale, began to cry not tears of joy, but tears that she would know she would not find a husband. <laughs> yeah. I, Plus, I mean, the other thing about Yale too is um, Yale at that period was n not a place that was well known to be um, favorable towards Jewish people. So her choice to um, her choice to go to Yale then um, I don't know if Albers himself was Jewish. I don't know the I don't know that, but um, her choice to go must have been isolating in other ways too. Mm. That's interesting. Yeah. Kaka, I want to hear about what you thought and and what your impression was of the, especially um, of the the parts about her daughter. Um, I mean, it's just you know, these are they're 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 tough films for me to 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 watch. Um, um, that's about um, any really mental health considerations. Uh, I mean sort of both professionally and, and personally. Um, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't really, um, I don't know that, <laughs> that I have really a good input here. Um, I, I do I, think- I, I, I mean, I, I wonder, you know, I don't know that I got like a good answer about how much she was, she felt influenced, you know, by, or how much how much of her motherhood and the struggles with you know with 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 parenting influence her art mm -hmm. uh, it's hard for me to answer that um, mm -hmm. from the film yeah i don't know if you that you guys have a have a better sense than than i than i have I think that's a good read, Kaka, because I think that that those two things are though though she has to, as Sean pointed out, she has to deal with the you know being a mother. It's not as if there's moments in the film when you know she kind of there's pieces of Vanitas where her daughter is actually kind of portrayed in 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 the art. Um, I, I this made me think, and Catherine, you'd be the authority to answer this, but in those Vanitas pieces. You know, you were talking about there being joy and mortality in there. I wonder if having a child who she seems very joyful with, um, despite her daughter's limitations, um, maybe that's what kind of do you do you think that could have been some influence? The film doesn't make any point about that, but do you think that could have some influence of why that art kind of brings mortality and joy into kind of alignment in a way that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's like a larger like not necessarily just because of her um, daughter's mental illness and because or because of how ill-equipped she was to deal with it just because the the tools weren't there and the and the support wasn't there. Um, I think in general, motherhood was seems like it was very difficult for her. Right, like um, because she's trying to have a career, and because at first she had a husband who didn't care about helping, and I, I just so I think there's just sadness and and um, kind of anguish in general uh, that that comes through in her work, and um, especially in those beautiful like religious icons that she did, and there's that one point where she says, you know. Mary was crying for her son and I was crying for my daughter because I didn't know how to communicate with her and I didn't know how to help her. And that was, that was the only time that I noticed her explicitly explaining um, her relationship with her daughter being reflected in her work. And she even went out of her way to say, I didn't think of that then, but I think of it now. So she, looking back, she believes that that was an influence, but it, she wasn't cognizant of it at the time, which is interesting. Yeah, and I mean, it, it also the, what was great about the documentary too is that it talked about a, a little bit about her sort of upbringing and her mother being absent for a lot of her childhood as well um, due to like, you know, working outside the home and all this kind of stuff. So she 
<clears throat> didn't re you know she one of her regrets was like you know when the other kids were getting picked up from school by their mothers that her mother was never there and um you know kind of like influent you know it kind of affected her going forward as as be and when she became a mother too of sort of like the sort of nostalgia that our culture sort of gives motherhood and how what a perfect mother is yeah. um, so that pressure um you know it's was, it was really interesting and I, I felt like it did you know especially with that the painting with the the mirrors and the skulls and the wheel of fortune with that little kind of like small portrait uh, in the very ornate frame very nostalgic almost portrait of her daughter uh, younger in it um kind of like you know spoke to sort of her that sort of like longing for that kind of like perfect motherhood sort of like symbolism um yeah. You know, in the sort of the mix of like death and and joy and sadness as well. Catherine, I, want, I wanted to ask you about the making of the of the the making of the film because you obviously, as somebody who's done you know programming, at, you know, at, at, at a major museum, um, certainly you. I'm sure you've had to look at a lot of documentaries, bio biopic documentary, you know, you know, bi bi biographical documentaries about artists. This one really stood out to me, and I wanted to ask you, you know, how you felt about that, because, you know, you you found this film, and um, I, I've never seen a one that was as compelling, so I wanted to ask you how it compares or what it's doing differently. Sorry to put you on the spot with that question. <laughs> well, the thing that comes to mind is that it's not a portrait of someone who's kind of frozen in time. Like, I feel like you see a lot of documentaries about artists who are still living, but their current existence is kind of like an epitaph at the end, where right? they're like, and they're still here. Um, but this was totally um, fluid from from her, you know, start, like from her childhood to now. Um, her her work right now is is given equal emphasis, and it's just so it's made so clear that she is still evolving um, and and curious and totally just a badass and someone to look up to um yeah like and, and and her voice is in it throughout too it's it's not like someone else's perspective on her um it's 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 like an autobiographical documentary even though she didn't make it herself i love that moment when she puts the she has to put the booties on to walk into pollock's studio yes. and and she just she says, you know, can you believe we got to put the, you know, he used to walk around here, you know, with us and, you know, and it was just, he, she's hysterical. She's got it. She's got a lot of humor in the way she presents herself as well. She's super funny, but she's not like overly cynical because then she gets into the Pollock room and she's like marveling at this little spot where he's painted. I'm so I, I love that she, <laughs> she's like, she's not going to write him off, but she is going to like take him with a grain of salt. <laughs> and I also love that like, you know, all of his work is around her on the walls and celebrated but then she's looking at this spot on the floor which was actually br like breathtaking <laughs> and and also touched by him as well which he which he sort of commented on she does like you know it's not wasn't always about what was on the wall it was about the process mm -hmm. um and i love that she said when she was like working in school that she was throwing paint at 30 feet and i was just like just thinking about the sort of physicality of that it was really <laughs> insane <laughs> I, I like to when I mean, she didn't say this explicitly. And so maybe I'm projecting but she talks about how when back in the 50s when she was pretty squarely just like an abstract expressionist and and knew Pollock and all those guys and she was just like hanging out with this boys club. Um, I imagine that maybe as a young woman, she was more interested in, in fitting in with them and like eventually found her way into like, I think about um, like when I first became interested in, pro in like film and programming, I would go see like midnight movies and, and art house theaters. And it was always like criterion stuff and like the canon that has been defined, like it's very Eurocentric, it's like very male um, and I really wanted to be a part of that club. I was like, I want to understand. I want to like know all about movies so I can be cool like these like programmers who are who are who are like putting together these programs. And then eventually, you're like, I don't want to be a part of that club. I want to make my own club. 
and it kind of seems like she she got there too although I, I think maybe she was just always always amazing and like a, con a contrarian <laughs> Um, if you, Catherine, I'm going to have another put you on the spot question. If you had the benefit to meet her at some point, or if she came to an interview with you, what would you really want to ask her? Oh, oh, geez, Louise, Joanne. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I really want, I'm really like nosy about sort of people's mental health and emotional life just like that's how I get to know people is by like oversharing about things like anxiety and depression and things and, like and like it's like as, as long as you, when you get that stuff out uh you you just feel immediately close to someone so I do want to know about I want to know about like you said why she stopped painting I want to know how it really felt when she was at her lowest and she talked about how she didn't want to live anymore when she first became a mother um and how she got out of that I don't know. That stuff interests me a lot, and and of course, a, a documentary is is out of respect only going to go so deep into into those topics. So yeah, I, I want to know like, what was it like? What was it all? What was like it like experiencing all of this from your perspective? I, I want to ask her. Um, I, I want her to teach me how to be a badass like she is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How long did the movie take to make? Do you know, Catherine, or do you guys know? Um... Um, it it seems like it was it, it and again I don't know this is a guess okay but I, it seems like it was it was made in 2017 when that um, when the parish did the retrospective of her work so um, I'm guessing that it was made in you know it was made around the time that that it wasn't made for that because we see her go to that retrospective so um, but I I don't know we haven't asked ever that question so we don't know that is that's a good one yeah. Yeah. We, we need, we need Henry, myself, I'm always curious how long it took. I mean, I've worked on documentaries for seven years or for two, so it's always, you know. <laughs> I want more archival footage from that women, um, was it Women Making Women art um, sort of show where she, in the 70s, that sort of yeah. happened. Because that all of the the sort of like the clips that they showed from the artwork in there was so fascinating with like Judy Chicago and like the so the use of textiles and weaving and all, all this kind of like womanly sort of arts um so fascinating and like so beautiful like i, I you know <laughs> talk about fomo <laughs> i know don't you want to go to that exhibit so bad <laughs> exactly. and like go to their talks about it and stuff yeah, yeah. Oh. how are we doing on time sean i think we need to wrap wrap because it is nine o'clock. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for coming again to the Boston Women's Film Festival. Spread the word about this film because it is magnificent. Thank you guys. Thank you, Catherine Irving for enlightening us. 